Alternative engine is ingenious. For three centuries, these ingenious designs have been the ultimate expression of man's desire for technical excellence. And through many generations of technological progress, they've had a profound effect on the way people travel and work. Steam engines replaced the horse. Electric motors and gasoline engines replaced the steam engine. Then, the jet engine and the rocket engine took things to a higher level. And now, micro-technology engines are proving that less is more. This march through the centuries began when the steam engine ushered in the Industrial Revolution. It freed mankind from total dependence on primary sources of power like wind, water, and muscle. Steam engines would be used to power factory machinery, trains, ships, tractors, and automobiles. Before steam, mostly we used animals uh, as our mode of transportation. When steam came along, of course, we could move more material faster and more reliably than we could, of course, with animals. And so that was a big transformation. People became less tied to being in small cities. They could live out in the farm and still be connected, if you will, to the cities. In a steam piston engine, steam enters one end of a cylinder and pushes a piston back. Then it enters the other end, pushing it the other way. The steam comes from a boiler, a metal water container that is heated, usually by burning fuels like wood, coal, oil, or natural gas. A steam turbine engine is like a windmill, except that its blades are propelled by hot steam under high pressure instead of wind. To this day, steam turbines are widely used. In fact, they are used to generate most of our electricity. The Greek scientist, Hero of Alexandria, built the world's first steam engine about 2,000 years ago. It was basically just a round metal ball with two kettle-like spouts coming out of it. When steam was piped into the ball, it spun around. Hero put it on display at the Serapeum, a museum in Athens where it entertained visitors for years, although it was never viewed as anything more than an interesting toy. In 1705, two British engineers, Thomas Savory and Thomas Newcomen, produced a large steam engine that could be used to pump water out of flooded coal mines. The engine used a piston, a rod-like device that moved back and forth inside a tubular enclosure called a cylinder. These early engines didn't have the gearing that con could convert reciprocal motion into circular machine driving motion. Uh, that didn't happen until the 1770s when James Watt developed what is probably the most famous steam engine of the 18th century. James Watt, a professor at the University of Glasgow, developed several improvements for the steam engine, making it much more practical to drive machinery. His flying ball governor expanded as the engine went faster centrifugal force caused the heavy metal balls to spread out and that closed a steam valve which slowed the engine down and as it spread out it would control the movement of steam into the cylinder and that was a very efficient device to keep it from revving out of control but more importantly to keep it in a steady regular uniform motion by 1800, more than 1,500 steam engines were at work in Britain, Europe, and the United States. In addition to pumping water out of mines, they were also powering factory machines. Britain was the, the first nation in the, in the West and in the world, really, to become industrialized. And so much of what was going on there was built around the advent of steam power. By 1830, steamships were making regular crossings of the Atlantic. The earliest steamships didn't look much different from the sailing ships of that period. They still had tall masts and sails, but the big difference was the large paddle wheel in the middle of the ship. Turned by a steam engine, it provided extra power for the ship as it clawed its way through the water. Both steamboats, then later railroads, you know, dramatically shortened uh, the time that people could traverse long distances. Uh, the, the American politician 
John C. Calhoun often used the expression about conquering space. And basically that's what these machines did, was that they helped to conquer space. They shortened distances between two places. That was particularly true of the steam piston engines riding the ribbons of steel that opened up the American West in the 1800s. In 1860, there were more than 30,000 miles of railroad tracks in the U.S. And in 1869, the Golden Spike was driven at Promontory Point, Utah to unite the Union and Central tracks which ran from the East and West Coasts. Most American trains at the time were pulled by so-called 440 steam engines, which had four lead wheels and four driving wheels. They weighed about 50 tons. Another important application for the steam engine was in farm equipment. Whether you're burning straw in the field with an agricultural engine, whether you're burning wood, whether you're back east and you're burning coal, you know, the steam engine was very adaptable and, and hungry for any fuel you could feed it. And that made it ideal for farm use. Huge steam tractors began to transform agriculture in the late 1800s. That was an era when uh, terms like behemoth, leviathan, <laughs> some of those terms were very commonly used. Uh, some of these engines, you know, weighed up 10, 20 tons. Huge. In the mid-1800s, an American, George Corliss, developed the most important new steam engine invention since James Watt. His new governor system allowed the engine to run more steadily, making it ideal for use in textile mills. This Corliss-designed engine, recently restored, was one of three installed at a sugar mill in Southern California in 1911. For the next 67 years, it powered machinery that refined sugar beets into sugar. They had steam readily available to cook and clean the beets, power all the machinery. It powered a generator in that factory, so they had the lights and the power for everything else, and the motive power to run the centrifuge to uh, run the sugar out of the beet pulp. So, you know, very efficient system. The you know, steam engine just did it all. The huge flywheel weighs 19,000 pounds, and the entire engine weighs 90,000 pounds. The 300-horsepower engine was in service until 1978, when the Holly Sugar Mill in Santa Ana was torn down. A completely new kind of steam engine, one that had no pistons, was pioneered in the late 1800s by two engineers, Charles Parsons of Britain and Carl de Laval of Sweden. And it's the only type of steam engine that is still in wide use today. Steam turbines, which use steam pressure to turn fan-like blades on a rotor, are more compact than steam piston engines and usually permit higher temperatures and greater steam expansion. That means more power. By the early 1900s, several steam turbine ocean liners were in Atlantic service. By 1920, the steam turbine had eliminated the older steam piston engines on major vessels. The great transatlantic liners from the Queen Mary launched in 1934 to the United States launched in 1951 were all driven by steam turbines. Today, U.S. Navy aircraft carriers and submarines are powered by nuclear steam turbine plants. The TV you're watching right now is in all likelihood being powered by steam. Since the majority of electric power plants in America use steam turbine engines, including nuclear plants like this one. The power plant engine is indeed a steam engine, whether, again, the heat source is a nuclear source or a coal or natural gas, it is, uh, it is a steam engine. It's somewhat ironic that we still use a technology that was invented almost 200 years ago. The water circulates through the core, picks up the heat from the fission event, takes it to the steam generator where it flashes to steam, goes out of the, out of the uh, steam generator into the main steam pipes, into the main turbine where it turns the turbine to make electricity. Steam turbines may be going strong, but steam piston engines have long been silent. They haven't been manufactured in the U.S. since the 1950s. But the sound of the steam piston is all around at the Antique Engine Museum in Vista, California, near San Diego, where they have dozens of working steam engines. 
In their day, they were impressive images of unprecedented power. But there were inherent flaws that turned these fire-breathing monsters into dinosaurs. Heat transfer is a slow process, and in the steam engine, one needs to transfer heat from a hot fluid, namely the combustion gases, to the working fluid that actually produces the power, namely steam. And people found that by using an internal combustion engine, where the thing that does the expansion and the thing that generates the heat is one and the same material, namely the fuel-air mixture, that one could get much more power out of a given size engine. But before the internal combustion engine came along, another new machine showed up to help power the world. It wasn't an engine, and it didn't burn fuel. Up next, the electric motor wins a place among the engines of the world. In the early 1800s, a good hand weaver could produce 48 yards of cloth in a week. A weaver working at a steam loom could produce seven times as much. Engines will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to engines on Modern Marvels. When steam engines first came into widespread use in the early 1800s, they were extremely powerful. But that power came at a price. They were also extremely dangerous. To create maximum power, their boilers had to contain steam at high pressures. They weren't always up to the task. There were a lot of problems in the 19th century with the explosion of boilers. Before you know it, you'd have an explosion that could kill everyone. Robert Stirling, a clergyman in Scotland in the early 1800s, was tired of seeing his parishioners getting injured or killed by exploding steam engines. So he decided to do something about it. Part inventor, part preacher, 100% renaissance man. He was an incredible guy. Sterling came up with an entirely new engine design in 1816, which he called a hot air engine. Today, it's known as the Sterling engine. The Sterling engines that he developed were low pressure engines. And so they, there was nothing really in there that was a high pressure that could explode even if the machine failed. Stirling engines are engines that heat one side of the engine and cool the other side of the engine. And then there's a mechanism inside the engine that moves the air back and forth between the hot side and the cold side. When the air is on the hot side, it expands and pushes up on a piston. When the air is on a cold side, it contracts and pulls down on a piston. But there was a problem with Reverend Sterling's invention. The metals used in the 1800s were not heat resistant enough to make the Sterling engine as durable as a steam engine. The metals didn't stand up to the high temperature of continuous flying. The, the boiler is the part of the steam engine that is exposed to continuous flying. Um, in a Sterling engine, it's the hot cylinder of the engine, so it's a different part of the engine. But with today's modern metallurgy, some believe the Stirling engine may now be viable. Brent Van Arsdell manufactures small demonstration engines that show off the unique capabilities of Reverend Stirling's invention. One of the engines runs on the hot air from a cup of coffee. But surprisingly, it also runs on the cold air from a bowl of ice. All it needs is a temperature difference to make it run. All you've got to do is keep one side hot and the other side cold. You can do that any place that you can keep the temperature difference. These things will run. This Stirling engine can run on the heat from the palm of your hand. Now, over the decades, people have tried to put Stirling engines in vehicles. And the conclusion right now is, no, it's an expensive engine much more expensive than the sort of alternatives 